Let's see. It's been a week. A week? Or it hasn't right, been a week. Just a, a week. week since what? Well, since we last met. Just a week. And if I'm reading this correctly, in that week, Abraham has aged 13 years. Oh. Now, if that's not a miracle, I don't know what is. Well, I'll take your word for it. That he aged 13 years in that week. Well, it says here, when we left off in verse 16 of chapter 16, that Abraham was fourscore and six years old when Hagar bare Ishmael to Abraham. 86. 17 opens with these words. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, that's 13 if I'm doing the numbers right, Don't look at me. the Lord appeared to Abraham and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now before we go any further, there's something I want to point out. Right here in this first verse, and you've heard me say this over and over and over, that Genesis is a book of one beginning and many firsts. And there's another first that just occurred here. God comes down and identifies himself as the Almighty God. He's using a name he's not used yeah. before. Get my glasses out. Book of one beginning. <clears throat> one beginning, many firsts. Many firsts. And this is the first use of the of the divine name El Shaddai. The overpowering one. We translate Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. It sounded like a tall order to me. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and will multiply thee exceedingly. And Abraham fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations, and neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be called Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful. And I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Is that Abraham... A first also. Then. That's a first right there. Abram itself means exalted father. When you add the extra syllable and it becomes Abraham, it means a father of a multitude. And given the language that God has just used with Abraham, it's a multitude of nations, not just of people. And then you have from verses 6 to the end of verse 8, encapsulated, condensed, and very specific. This is the Abrahamic covenant in these verses. Now God has before, has promised that he's going to give him a land, he's going to give him progeny, he's going to give him a great name, he's going to bless him, and he'll bless everybody else through him. But until you get to these verses, 6 to 8, God never directly, under this name of El Shaddai, as he said this. Now, one of the reasons why I'm stopping at this point is because there are already three sections to this. This is the end of the first section. <laughs> A couple of things have happened. Um, I want to go back and I want to see if we can put ourselves, if we could for a minute, in some of those well-traveled sandals that Abraham is wearing. He's 99. Even in those days, that's old. <laughs> Sarah is 90. <clears throat> but he had a promise of progeny. And for 13 years, he's had Ishmael, a son. As far as it goes with Abraham, Abraham has every reason to think that Ishmael is the promised son. There's no condemnation of Abraham or his action with Agar between chapters 16 and 17, but 13 years. Now in 13 years, you've got this boy who's, oh, he's probably beginning to stretch out a little now. He's growing into those knobby knees. He's probably eating like a horse, growing like a weed. 
and his father probably has to forcefully encourage him to bathe just a little bit more often, <laughs> as we know how young men grow up. And the other thing is you better kind of hold back. Oh, the Bible hasn't said yet, but it will. Abraham dotes on him. This is the apple of Abram's eye. This is what he thinks is the foundation of his hope for descendants. And at 99, the only son he's going to have. And apparently is satisfied. Now God comes down. Now I want you to notice it says that he appeared to Abram. This is a personal appearing. I do not, it doesn't say vision, it doesn't say dream. It says appeared. Now I don't know what form he took. And I don't know that it matters or I think it would probably say. But this is a personal appearing. See anybody with God when he shows up? No. He's alone. So is Abram. That's the way God meets with every one of us. When there is a business to be conducted between God and the child of God, it is intensely personal. This gets really, really personal. God declares for the first time the name of of the land, the geographical location, where or which he will give to Abraham's descendant. And puts a name to it. Canaan. Just before it's a land I'll show you, or the land where thou art, where you are a stranger, now he has put a name to it. And it's a name well known to Abraham. He knows exactly now where he's talking about. And he's sitting right in the middle of it up in Hebron. But watch what he says. I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. That's all future tense. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed, and I will give unto thee, and to thy seed the land wherein thou art a stranger. All the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. You notice he's used that word everlasting twice? Mm -hmm. He's used it relative to the covenant, and he's used it relative to the land. And you cannot separate those two anymore. You can't separate Abram from it. You can't separate the covenant from it. You can't separate the descendants from it. It's going to stay that way. For how long, do you suppose? Everlasting. As long as time lasts. Everlasting. We would say until the age of ages. The last bit syllable of recorded time. That's how long it's going to go. <clears throat> and God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee and their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Let's stop right there. What's the covenant? Going back to the, I will bless those that. Well, you're talking somebody, this specific covenant. Somebody read out loud, verse 10, to me. Take a shot at it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this, this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your posterity after you. Every male among you shall be. Circumcision. Okay, so my question to you is, what's the covenant? Circumcision. Be circumcision. <laughs> Pretty apparent, isn't it? No, it's not. No. Well, it's a bloody thing. It's a blood. <laughs> it's a. Uh, Moses' wife is going to tell him that to his face. Thou art a bloody husband unto me. Right, and this is the same. It's not spoken there, but it's the sealing of this covenant, I, I guess, with blood, I'm thinking, unless I'm wrong. Well, see. there's a lot of things going on here. That's part of it. There's also part of it the fact that it's very, very physical. And you heard me last week kind of rail on you that the physical never types the spiritual. Physical types, physical, spiritual types, spiritual. Don't mix those two up, but they're always together. But they do not type each other. Now I know what that word says. This is my covenant which ye shall keep. 
Mm. How many times have you heard that the Abrahamic covenant is unconditional? Have you ever heard that before? Nope. Well, it is. God doesn't come down and say, let's have a vote on what we're going to do. No, he says, this is the way it is. Paul tells us that the gifts and callings, and that's what this is, are without repentance. They are irrevocable. There's nothing that God will do or say to alter, change, or bring it back. There's nothing Abraham can do to fall from it. So who has responsibility for the keeping of the covenant? Who walked alone between those pieces that Abraham laid out? God. And when it says that God swore by himself, it just doesn't mean he held up his name and swore by it. He swore it alone. He didn't have any help. God's God, covenant. God's covenant. Mm -hmm. What you see is the sign mm -hmm. of the covenant. And it says that you shall keep. That word means to regard with reverence. To be watchful. It comes from a Hebrew root, which means to build a hedge around. Well, what he's supposed to build a hedge around in his constant remembrance is placed there by the word of Almighty God. Abraham didn't speak it. He's supposed to remember. And it's a generational promise to him and to his seed forever. Everlasting. And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be, here we go, a token of the covenant betwixt you and me. Now, this is the same way that God says to Noah, my covenant I establish with you. I place my bow in the heavens. The rainbow is not the promise. It's the reminder <coughs> of the promise that every time you see it, and every time I see it, I'll remember the promise as if God was ever going to forget it. He's the one who made it. God's not going to forget. It's there so that we will remember that God will not forget. <laughs> and we'll be told later that part of Abraham's faith is he believed that everything God said he would perform. Not only would, but could. Now, Let's go back and get into Abraham's sandals again. Uh, back there in verse 1. <clears throat> Abraham is not all that far removed, personally, from being an idol worshiper. Right. right. This is not a guy who's walked 99 years with God Almighty. This is not Enoch. Mm -hmm. This is a redeemed son. This is the guy that God comes down to in that name Jehovah, the redemptive name, Savior. Uh, get out of here and go somewhere else and I'll meet you there and we'll talk again, basically. And he left and he went. Now he knows him as the Redeemer because he knows what's happened to him. That types the beginning of our Christian law. And I mean physically. He Phys knows him as Redeemer because of what happened when he went into Egypt and, and God, that's one aspect. He brought him back out of Egypt safely. And that was right. his great fear. But he also brought him out of Ur safely. Yeah. Right. He also brought him out of Haran safely. safely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's when he gets to Canaan, builds that first altar. There is your redeemed son. Now he's beginning to offer back to God the word that he has received. And that's really all we have to offer in worship. What are we going to bring? Mm -hmm. What are we going to bring other than exactly. the word of God? Exactly. Yeah, you come with nothing empty, worthy to bring. You come with empty hands, and they're not even clean hands. No. At least speaking personally. And I said this was intensely personal. <clears throat> he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generation. He that is born in the house and bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Mm -hmm. Now let me ask you, how much of a decision, that's one of the words that Billy Graham's people like to use a lot, 
how much of a decision is an eight-year-old boy, eight-day-old boy, mm -hmm. baby yeah. boy, going to make about accepting or rejecting this covenant? Yes. Zero. Exactly. He has as much chance of arguing it as Abraham does at this point. Abraham has no standing place to argue either. Now Abraham, if he wants to, can walk away. Now God isn't going to call her, uh, is not going to call a gift back. But you can walk away from it. You can refuse to take it up. <laughs> now you'll do it at your own peril. The gift you're talking about now is life. Any God. gift. Because God will not take back a gift or it's not a gift, it's a loan. Right. But we can walk away from it. A I'm gift of the Spirit, gift. Absolutely. Just because I have a gift of tongues doesn't mean I have to operate it. I can have a gift of healings, and if I choose not to operate, it isn't going to operate. That doesn't stop God from being a healer. It doesn't stop God from speaking to a child of his without me or in spite of me. But I can. I can choose not to do it. Abraham chooses to follow. That's why he shows up in the 11th chapter of Hebrews in that Hall of Fame of Faith. Because he continued that walk, even though he didn't see the end of the road. Now, remember, this issue of circumcision includes Ishmael. Oh, yeah, right. And the reason you know, it says, every man child in your generations. Well, Abraham is the one who generated Ishmael with Hagar. He counts. All right, one that is born in the house, that would be like, you know, well, you remember the name of his steward, Eliezer of Damascus, we thought was going to be his heir. You think that guy doesn't have kids? Mm -hmm. Of course he does. That child, which is born to a servant of Abraham in Abraham's house, is going to be circumcised too. And anybody who Abraham, since then, would have bought with money, and that includes those people that come out of Egypt with him. The Pharaoh. Everybody for whom Abraham has patriarchal authority. Now, any of them, now I don't have Bible to say this, but I would be willing to, to venture that anybody who is in Abraham's house could have walked away at that point. Sure. And I'd be willing to bet that Abraham would let him go. Abraham didn't go after Hagar. She came back because God told her to. So it tells you that Abraham has a pretty uh, loyal household. It's well ordered. They look to him. They listen to him. They've seen him build the altars. They also see, as Abimelech is going to see down the road, that the blessing <coughs> and promise of God is with this man. Abraham will assume, before the end of this chapter, that patriarchal authority for every male in his household and his response to this, this, by the way, is a command. It's not a suggestion. It's immediate obedience. He's not, he's not dragging his feet on this one. He's learned a little along this way, as I suppose we all do uh, in, a, in a Christian walk. We learn by experience, and we learn by watching what God does and what he brings to pass in our life. I can't be argued out of that. You can't tell me that God is not a dealer. I'm well past that. I've, I've seen what he can do there. You can't tell me that he's not a savior. I am a witness. I was there when it happened to me. Okay? You can't, you can't argue me out of that. Abraham is in that part, but Abraham is still as much a human as you are. You think you're as far in the walk as you're going to be down the road? Not if we make it down the road, right? And neither is Abraham, because at the age of 99... He sees that Ishmael is the child of promise, and God is about to tell him, you ain't seen nothing yet. <laughs> as good as this is, now this man is enormously rich, he's enormously powerful, he and three friends just went up and whipped up on four kings and their armies, robbed them blind, basically, by right of conquest, and brought it all back. That's a pretty good afternoon's work for a powerless man. But let's remember what Melchizedek told him. Blessed be the Most High God who has delivered your enemies into your hands. 
And he had, what, 218 train servants who watched it happen, who knew there was no way in the world they're going to take on four kings, and they did, and they won and came back. And they'll notice that after all of that, the death count is all on the other side. It doesn't say Abraham lost anybody. His three friends all come back. They divide the stuff up. And God says, as good as that was, you're about to see something even better than that, and you'll watch these types now begin, uh, begin to develop. We talked a little about types last week. <clears throat> Verse 15, here's where the life change comes. So God, here's what the this is where the life change comes. And God said to Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. That name is just changed from my princess, which is possessive, to princess. No possessive. It's worldwide now. Mm. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. I will give thee a son also of her. Pretty bold talk coming down to a 99-year-old man whose body, whose generative powers are as good as dead. That's what the Bible tells us about Abraham. Mm -hmm. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? Shall Sarah, and shall Sarah, that is ninety years old, bear? Notice those numbers there. He puts his age at a hundred, doesn't he? Well, he's ninety-nine. Sarah, he puts at ninety and bear. This is so precise because the child is going to be born in the next year at which time Abraham will be a hundred. But Sarah will bear that child for 180 days while she's 90. See how precise that language is? Now, you want to tell me that Abraham laughed in doubt or unbelief? I ain't buying that one. He might be perplexed joyfully. He might wonder how this is going to happen. Because he knows his circumstance. This is, this, is an, this is an intensely personal meeting. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. This isn't going to be an allegory. She's really going to have it. And thou shalt call his name Isaac, which means laughter. And I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. As for Ishmael. Now, now he reaffirmed the covenant or he oh, oh, oh. he's restating it and just, he is re, and he's not redefining it. I do not believe this covenant is ever reconfirmed. I don't believe it's ever renewed. Everlasting is everlasting. When does it get old? He's just restating it. Oh, he's telling him specifically about things he didn't know before. Before all he knew that his the promise would come to him and to his seed. Well, Ishmael's his seed, and God just told him, yeah, no. He's your son, but he's going to tell him, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Isaac is the child of promise. Ishmael is the child of the best Abraham could do in the flesh. Mm -hmm. Now those types will develop from there. And we'll see some New Testament confirmation of that in a minute. And Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. I told you that man dotes on this boy. He intercedes immediately for Ishmael. And God said, Sarah, thy well shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and proceed after him. And as for Ishmael, I have, what? Heard, Heard thee. Behold, I have, past tense, blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation, but, this is one of the big buts of the Bible, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto you. Look at this. At this set time next year, you see how much more definitive mm -hmm. this statement is becoming? 
Before, he just says, you, 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 you and Sarah are going to have a son. Now he's saying within 365 days, he's going to be there. And Abram's as good as dead. Humanly speaking, you say, well, I hope I can live long enough to see it, let alone how we want to make this happen, because he knows he can. And he knows Sarah can. And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. <clears throat> Here's Abraham's response. And Abraham took Ishmael his son and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day, as God said unto him, the very same day. Now watch how these covenants work out. Uh, God established his covenant of, of preservation with Noah. And the very day that the, the, uh, the water began to fall from the sky is the day that Noah went into the ark. The very day that the word comes down to Abram from Almighty God, the response is immediate obedience. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> you cannot tell me that that man stood there on his face or otherwise, and die. Because as soon as he's on his feet, he's taking care of things. And Abram was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, and Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abram circumcised and Ishmael, his son. <coughs> Told you that covered Ishmael. Told you that Abraham assume patriarchal responsibility. Not just for Ishmael, but for his entire house, which at this time is huge. So this thing of faith and obedience are... Yeah, Ooh. you might want to take this and read the book of James again. <laughs> and remember... If I believe God, if I really believe God, then I'm going to act. It's going to, I'm going to act on it. I'm he gonna... will work. He will live it out through you. Okay. In the same yeah. way, yeah. in the same way that Abraham cannot produce <laughs> Isaac, he can't. Yeah, but God can, and He'll do it through Abraham yeah. and Sarah. Because now you have to harken back to what was said in the garden: "For these two are one flesh." Yeah. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Those are the three classes. Ishmael is his son of his generation. Uh, Eliezer of Damascus and those that's been with him for some time are servants born in the house. And then there are others that are bought with money. There are the three classes. He takes responsibility for all of them. All of them are included under, uh, under the sign of the covenant. And don't tell me they all weren't blessed. Now... If nothing else comes to them individually, you know what their blessing is? They get to hang around Abraham. Oh. And that is not something that is granted to every Tom, Dick, and Harry in Canaan, let me tell you. But these are. And they share in the blessings. Now let's take a look at what's just happened over these three chapters, or three sections of this chapter. God came down and personally appears to Abraham changes his name, which by the way is a further revelation of that progressive revelation I'm always talking about. Abraham always was named exalted father. He is, he is uh, basically the ruler of a huge household. He has a son of his own body. And because he's held in great reverence by those around him, except by the four kings that he killed, <laughs> He's an exalted talk. God's promise is there, but it is not yet fulfilled in the one that God picked. And God's timing, which I find very interesting here, Abraham is 99 years old, and God says, we're not quite there yet. A little patience. You're not old enough to have this son yet. Now, later in the next chapter, he's going to turn and he's going to ask the question, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer to that, of course, is no. And what he's chosen to do, he will accomplish. My word will not return unto me void, but it will accomplish that toward which I purposed it. And let's never forget, God's purpose is redemption. 
before he identifies himself to Abram, his friend from whom he doesn't hide anything, he has already shown himself to be under that redemptive name. <clears throat> Even before he shows him that he's the Almighty God, which is news to Abraham. <clears throat> now he knows he's the Most High, but let's remember, he's, he's an idol worshiper. He comes from a culture of many gods. And now there is an Almighty God, and if that's true, I don't, I, let's say you did believe in, in 1,300 and how many other gods. If there's only one that's almighty, what use do you have of any of the others? They are useless, which in fact is what an idol is. Useless. He's identified himself as the one overpoweringly able redeemer. And he's going to work this out in his children, physically and spiritually. And we think, well, no, it's really, it's really all, you know, once you get the New Testament, it's all on the spiritual side. Well, not if you believe in a resurrection. That's, that's pretty physical. I'm hoping. That's just my hope. I don't know how you see it, but that's my hope. Does this tie together with them be a living sacrifice? In other words, with the physical part of us is the living sacrifice. That's right. That is... God only asked one son to die. Yeah. He's asked all the rest of his children to live. So that's the physical part of it. It's the spiritual part of it. that. And, that Paul, and Paul will say, and it isn't me, but it's Christ in me. In me. Right, right. In and Christ and Christ in me. And the Christ doing glory. Yeah, Christ living it out. But then he also tells us that's not only the animus, that's not only what gets you going. Did I say animus? Mm -hmm. That thing is running. That's wrong. That's the animating force. Animus is hatred. I didn't mean it. Yeah. Rick was going to set us all the right. Anim the animating force, in other words, the actions should be equal to... Now you want to get to the spiritual side? Yeah. The baptism with the Holy Spirit is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And don't separate that word glory from resurrection ever. He was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. And when he stood in front of the tomb of Lazarus, he said, you're going to see the glory of God. Mm -hmm. That's the reason I'm here. Well, if he'd been here a little earlier, he wouldn't have died. You well, you don't think he's going to come up? Well, he will on the last day. Now, and once again, God in that son says, you ain't seen nothing yet. Mm -hmm. You're not going to have to be as patient as Abraham. It's going to happen right now. The one who brings life from the dead can bring it from a, 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 dead, a, a body that's as good as dead or one that is really dead. Yeah. He's almighty, and that's kind of the job description of almighty. His reason to think that Ishmael is going to be the child of promise is because, number one, he is his true son, and two, he was promised a child. Ishmael fulfills that as far as what Abraham could see. That is not God's choice. Isaac is his choice. Has been all along. So El Shaddai comes down and says, let me show you how I choose. And this is where it's going to get really, really physical. <coughs> what does he tell us about Sarah? You mean where he changed her name from Sarai to Sarah, mm -hmm. from Prince S of the world or to Princess of the world? Is that, mm -hmm. is that what you're alluding to? We are aware of what's going to happen here down the road, aren't we? We're going to have this. Son. <coughs> We're going to have this son, right? He's actually born. He grows up in Abraham's house just the way Ishmael did. Ishmael doesn't particularly care for him. Yeah. And isn't that kind of 
not strange, but I mean, because Abraham doted on him. Little sibling rivalry there. Well, yeah. I mean, after we're gonna see it with after Cain, Isaac we're gonna see it with Jacob and Esau too. Well, yeah. We saw it really manifest with Cain and Abel. Yeah. This is this is what happens. But I just. But we'll the, the blessing is it. never removed. The blessing is never removed from Ishmael. God never calls that back. Ishmael, oh, Ishmael say, is blessed, and that blessing doesn't remove. And I'll tell you why. The land of Canaan is promised to Israel. Right. The, the, you know, the twelve tribes that come from Jacob, who comes from Isaac, who comes from Abraham. Ishmael also comes from Abraham. He says, "I'm going to." I'm going to bring 12 princes out of him. I'm going to make him a nation. I've got a blessing for you, but my guy's Isaac. Right, right. Ishmael is never taken out of the land. Israel is. Mm. They're taken off to Assyria. They're taken off to, to Babylon. And then finally, with the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD, they're taken out. Ishmael's children never leave. They're there now. They always were. They're never displaced. And I'll tell you something else. Arabic. From which we get Aramaic, which Christ himself spoke. That's Ishmael's language. It has never changed. Boy, Hebrew has. The Hebrew that they teach today over there in Jerusalem and Tel Aviv would be unintelligible to first century Israel. First century Israel, their Hebrew would have been unintelligible to David. And David, without the scribes continually uh, copying those scriptures as the language changed, if it, if, it, if it just copied the form of each one of those words, David would not have been able to read the books of Moses. But look at Ishmael's children. They're still there. And everything he said about them has come to pass. He told, he told Hagar, he's going to live among his brethren. His hand will be against every man. Every man's hand is against him. Do you know how many nations those Bedouins live in over there? There's Bedouins in Syria. There's Bedouins in Lebanon. There's Bedouins in, Sa in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, there's Bedouins in Jordan. There's Bedouins in Egypt. They're all over over there. <coughs> so where are you going to run them off to? They're pretty pervasive. Those are Ishmael's children. The gifts and callings of God are with repentance. I don't care who you are. He had a blessing for Ishmael. Now what they do with it is their choice. And how Israel responds to that is Israel's choice. And they're still fighting over there. But we go back, we look at that covenantal statement in verses 5 and 8. We see uh, the institution of circumcision for those three uh, classes of people, the family, those close to the family generationally, those servants, and the recent ones bought with money. In verse 15, it gets us to the promise by Sarah, this 90-year-old grandmother who in, within 365 days is going to take a trip with Abram down to Gerar, <laughs> where the king falls in love with his 90-year-old grandma and wants to marry her. Now, what do you suppose happened to her? God says two things in the timing of the birth of this child and the enabling of the birth of the child. Number one, at this set time next year, she'll have this son. We read that, didn't it? He will also say twice, I will return unto you according to the time of life. What do you think God meant by that? To this one whose body is as good as dead and Sarah's room is dead as well. I will return unto you according to the time of life. Well, according to the time of life would be youth when you're able to have children. Bingo. There's your type. You get a change, too. If you go by way of the grave, you get a resurrection. Whether you stand there and watch that happen or come up by way of the grave, we're all changed. Those gifts and callings are without repentance. And Sarah types the church. 
Thank you. He receives <coughs> the yeah, word of God that. physically. So do we. Now don't mistake that for the spirit. Don't mistake that for the spiritual. We physically assemble ourselves together. I physically stand here and talk. You physically hear me. That's not God. But God can take even the foolishness of preaching. He can put that into your heart and change you. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know that they were changed in the twinkling of an eye the way we're going to be. God had 300, well, biblical year, 360 days to work. <clears throat> and since nothing is too hard for him, I'm not going to say whether it happened in a moment or whether it happened in 360 days. It would have happened sooner than that because, boy, old Abimelech had somebody to fall in love with. No, I want you to watch what happens. That laughter. And by the time we get through with this story and Isaac is born, we're going to see where Abraham doesn't laugh alone. Sarah also laughs. And I'm saying it's not in disbelief. And the reason why I know is if we look at Romans, the fourth chapter, uh, I think it's 16 to 22, if I have everything correct. Which, so, I, so things manifest, you never really know. Uh, <clears throat> 16 of uh, chapter 4, Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be made sure to all the seed. I want you to notice that. All the seed. Not that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things that be not as though they were. He was not a father of many nations at that point, but that's what God called him. So distinctly that he changed his name, not just one or two, a multitude of nations. Who, against hope, believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not, look what he does not looking at now. Consider not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not after the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, believing and or giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that he pro had promised was able to also to perform. Did you know that that's what Lord means? What? When you see Lord in, in the New Testament, that's what Lord means. The one who said it is a able also to do it. That's what it means. And therefore it is imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone. Talking Abraham now. Picture's going to widen. Put yourself in it. That it was imputed to him. But for us also. To whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. Written for our sake. And there's a reason for that. Now I want you to look at what's happened when Isaac is born. That is life from the dead. The same God that calls this universe into being out of nothing brings life from the dead. The deadness of Sarah's womb, the deadness of Abraham's body. Now let's go to Galatians uh, 4, uh, 22 to 26. Paul speaking again. He's got a few things to say about this one. Uh, okay, Galatians. Galatians 4 again. Galatians 4, uh, 22. <coughs> For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Now we know that, don't we? The one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. The bondmaid is Hagar, the free woman is Sarah. Mm -hmm. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the what? Flesh. 
That's Abraham doing the very best he could. In his own strength, producing this of the flesh. But he of the free woman was by promise. There's your life from the dead. Yeah. Which things are a uh, what? That's symbolic. There is your type. That's what an allegory is. Scripture says this is an allegory. I have every right to use them as types, as long as we're careful on how we apply them. Spiritual type, spiritual, physical type, <coughs> spiritual, and both will manifest. Okay? Which things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. The one from Mount Sinai, which was gendeth to Hagar, which uh, gendeth unto bondage, which is Hagar. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. See how they're both in bondage, according to the Apostle Paul? Both Jerusalem. And when it says it answereth, it means it corresponds to. Remember, it's an allegory. There's got to be a correspondence here. But Jerusalem, which is present tense, which is above. That's the heavenly Jerusalem. Has nothing to do with, with uh, Mount Moriah over there. Which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. Under law, under circumcision, under the token, <coughs> or under grace by faith. All. The mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children. Then she which hath an husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Who does Isaac type? You. We read that again. Now we, comma, dead, dead in our trespasses and sins, but we have been made alive in. We the are alive from the dead if we're born again. Right. And if we're not born again, we're, we're, we're like dead, Pharaoh. We're, we're dead while we stand there. Right. Yeah. But look at 28. Now we, comma, brethren, comma, as Isaac was, comma, are, we are. We. I told you it would manifest, and it will manifest in you. And those gifts and callings are without repentance. God isn't going to take it back. In the same way that he was not going to take the promise of Isaac back from Abraham, he's going to try him sorely on that one. He won't take it back from us either. He is the same unchanging God, and he has children. He doesn't have grandchildren. And he treats them all the same. He's not a respecter of persons. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Judaism was persecuting Christianity. Nobody knew it better than Paul. Who knows how many he killed? Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the, of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free now go to 29 and 31. Born again. Born out of a dead body. Born by the Spirit of God. Yeah, just a minute here. I need to, I need, I, I need to do a, I need to, I need to backtrack just a little bit. I want to go to chapter 3. I jumped ahead of myself. Galatians 3. Galatians 3. Verse uh, 39. Wherefore then serveth the law? That's that covenant of bondage he's talking about. It was added because of transgression till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. Who's the seed? Now here's where, here's where you have to be careful about, about the types. Verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not to seeds, plural, as of many, but as one and to thy seed, which is Christ. That was to keep, keep us shut up to the promises of God until the one who could keep the promise, Abraham couldn't, we can't, 
But the one who could and the one who did, does it do away with the law? No. It fulfilled it. The law satisfied. And it is just as good today for an example of proper living as it ever was. But the price which the law points to, which the law could not produce, came. In the flesh. Manifested in the flesh. Yeah. And is translated in the same way that you are into that kingdom. And here's the thing. If you are an heir, you're the seed in the same way that Isaac was. And a child. And you're subject to the persecution that Paul just told you about. Here's another promise. Don't care what you're going through. I don't care what you've heard lately. Fear not. It's your father's good pleasure to give you the king. Not just translate you into it. To bestow it upon you. There is the promise to every born-again child of God. And I would suggest that if you have not reached that point, you get there quick. <laughs> and I don't mean that by a threat. I mean, you're going to miss a lot if you don't. You miss the ability to bring forth an Isaac in your own life. And who knows what God has available to you. That's my view of chapter 17 of Genesis. Any questions? No, but it was that him called Hail the Power of Jesus was free. Comments, strikes, complaints? Oh, no, that was simple there. Was really There's Rick, hardly any. Sure. Him? Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit uh, using gifts you've given to help us to receive this word. And now, Lord, as we um, go, uh, I pray you will work this word in us and have it accomplish what you've set it out to do. Lord, as we go upstairs, I pray that you open our eyes and ears and let us receive what you would have for us today. But, Lord, we especially just want to thank you for... Um, the covenant, and knowing that we can be uh, blessed as your children. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.